Uh, so anything we can get for now would be appreciated, and then we can look at that going forward. Thank you. With that, we'd like to uh, thank thank Gary Barth and the, the community uh, business community services to come forward and present. Thank you today. Good morning. It's still morning. Good morning, uh, the Budget Committee. I'm pleased to be here today to present uh, the Budgets for Business and Community Services. As uh, many of you know, Business Community Services is comprised of a mix of both uh, business and economic development services to our business community and our economic uh, development activities, as well as a number of community services ranging from parks to libraries to county fair and event center. Um, there are two special districts contained within business and community services, uh, the library district and the North Clackamas Park and Recreation District. Those have separate budget committees that will be convening next Monday. So the budget I'm presenting to you today are for the county departments that are within, that are not special districts um, that are within business and community services. So I do want to mention that the uh, business community services relies relatively little on general fund support. Our library network uh, system that we will talk about is our one department that's solely funded by uh, county general fund as part of an agreement with all the library cities when we formed the library district a number of years ago. And then county parks uh, continues to receive a small uh, portion of county general fund. Um, that was in place and negotiated as part of the uh, swapping off of the general fund and becoming an independent uh, enterprise uh, within the county. I do also want to mention that as we go through the indicators, uh, we are part of managing for results as well. I mean, we were one of the first uh, divisions to go through managing for results. Um, the indicators you see on this present today, presentation today are just a fraction of the measures that we track. Um, we've literally got uh, hundreds of services that we provide, and we're in a process uh, right now of identifying every service. The first round of MFR that we went through, we looked at every service provided by every division within the BCS department, and we grouped those into programs and then grouped those programs into the lines of business that you see here today. We're now going back and taking the exercise and saying, okay, that's the services we've been providing. Are those the services we should be providing going forward? So we're looking at every single service um, in every division with these questions. Does this service support the purpose statement of the division? Does this service support the purpose statement of BCS? Does the service have measurable outcomes and success metrics? Does this service deliver the intended value to citizens? Is this service, is this a service that only this division can provide versus another county or BCS department? Is this a service that only this division can provide versus another city, state, federal, or private party? Is this service required by county administration? Is this service required by law? So we're working with every one of our divisions and, and our consulting support and going through all of those questions to refine those services that will then get regrouped back into our program levels, into our lines of business. So I just want to kind of give that indication that there's a, there's a significant amount of work going on kind of behind the scenes across all of our divisions beyond the metrics that you see here. Um, we had to pick a few key metrics for each division to highlight in the budget process. So with that, I am now down to about 33 minutes, so I'll try to. <laughs> so those lines of business, this org chart here shows you that we've got six lines of business, including the administrative line of business that every uh, department has in the MFR process. And then in the blue are all of the programs that reside within those lines of business. So we've got uh, 16, 12, 13, 14, 15 programs across six lines of business, and we have a budget for each of those. Uh, this is just a prop uh, showing how we had one of our big projects was working on the North Milwaukee Industrial Area Development um, revisioning process with the city of Milwaukee as a key partner of ours. It's in their jurisdiction. Um, we um, contributed some funding to that effort as well as received this uh, CPDG grant from Metro for that project. Uh, the office of the director, that largely is myself and allocated. Um, we have four people in the administrative function of BCS. Laura Zentner, my deputy director, myself, and two support folks. 
and then we are funded through allocations to all of our lines of business. So again, it's, uh, it's a self-funded enterprise, if you will. No general fund support, uh, internal county services, NCPRD. Um, we provide the business services function to the North Clackamas Park and Recreation District and are reimbursed by that district for those services. So Laura is effectively the business services manager for NCPRD in, in addition to her deputy director um, function within business and community services. This is the area that we capture a, a large share of that work that Laura um, provides um, in the what we call budgeting, planning, and financial management. So the long-term forecasting of our financials, the reserves, contingencies, capital budgets, uh, long-range planning, uh, integral to the service analysis work um, that we're doing with managing for results. So a lot of that is driven out of Lord's uh, department um, and providing that kind of an enterprise-wide administrative support function to each of our lines of business. We find that's pretty efficient. We don't have to replicate those kinds of talents and energies uh, within each of our line of business. The, uh, all lines of business are managed then in a consistent, cohesive fashion. They all have financial forecasts. They all have adequate reserves. And they've all got uh, capital asset replacement strategies. Uh, that was talked about here a lot today. We've identified all the assets within uh, BCS and have those on a capital asset replacement schedule with uh, reserves being set aside for what we are able to fund uh, on those reserves. Yeah, you have a, are you going to ask a questions for Well, I was going to let them finish their presentation. Could you hold the, the questions or what's that? Would you like me to go back to the first or just stay here? I was wondering if we could let them go ahead and go through and, and, and we'll hold our questions to the end. Would that be okay then, this, this, this round, so we can let them go ahead and present and then we'll come back to their, would that be okay, this cycle? So, go ahead, thank you. Okay. But keep your questions and we'll, we'll hold them until the end if that would be okay. So again, the, these three, uh, the couple of metrics that we're highlighting here are uh, one of about over 20, I think, services that are provided by the BCS admin and identified and rolled up into uh, programs uh, as part of this line of business. These are just highlighting the ones where we know we have a perfect score. No, that's not, that's not that, that's the, true, the true statement. But it is uh, indicative of uh, on these, it's pretty uh, the standard reporting out here that we uh, want to provide all these uh, re resources to our line of business managers so they can be in compliance with Oregon budget law and have good uh, fiduciary um, management responsibilities. The first line of business beyond the admin function then is the fair and event center. And by the way, I have the line of business managers here with me today. Um, in the essence of time, I'm going to plow through this with Laura's assistance, but if you have any specific drill downs you'd like to do on one of our lines of businesses, we have the subject matter expert um, managers here to answer any questions that Laura and myself might not be able to manage. Lori Bothwell is our fair and event center manager. Again, as many of you may know, uh, the Fair and Event Center is a unique uh, in, uh, beast uh, within the BCS family. Um, the Fair and Event Center is under Oregon Rise statute, is an independent organization. They have their own appointed board and Lori and her staff are employees of the Fair and report to that Fair board. So they are not county employees, they're not part of my uh, direct responsibilities, but we do, the county does have the fiduciary responsibility of having the fair fund reside within the county's budget process. So this is the, the public budget process for the fair fund that is developed by Lori and her fair board. So she did participate with us uh, in the managing for results. Um, similar to the elected offices, they could have chosen to participate or not participate, but Lori was on board from the beginning and uh, took advantage of the training opportunities that were presented here. And uh, we broke it, her uh, line of business into two um, programs, the fair itself and the rodeo, which is a formerly six day and now a five day event that'll be occurring uh, in August. 
And then the next one I'll show you is the event center. And there, uh, we, we may consolidate those back into one because of the materiality or the immateriality of the event center on the overall impact of the, of the fair and event center process. This is a pretty simple measure as during the fair is what is the capacity for attendance? You know, and I liken this to a, a bowl game or a concert, you have a venue, you host this event, it has a certain amount of capacity, you can't exceed that by fire marshal standards and things. So what you shoot for is trying to get as many people in as you can legally accommodate. And then we're completely dependent on the weather. Um, if we have 90 plus degree days, 95, we see a dramatic impact on attendance. We've had that at least two or three times in the 10 years that I've been um, in, in BCS. Last year was another one where you can see the impact, 150,000 uh, targeted, 114,000 attendees. So we try to manage this the best we can, uh, but at the end of the day, it's, uh, we're, we're, we have a few lines of business that have a lot of seasonality to them, golf courses, outdoor campgrounds, and uh, the fair and the rodeo. So, uh, and then the rodeo attendance, again, is tied very directly to that, um, that fair attendance. Total budget is a 1.5 million, the main source of revenue, again, no general fund support. So they produce their own revenue um, from the fees that they charge um, for the facility and for um, the event, as well as a contribution from the tourism and cultural affairs department from the transient room tax uh, contribution. That is a prescribed formula um, that they receive. In this one, they've got a contingency set aside of 185,000. Um, the significant issues, um, there, there is a replacement underway right now um, of the Rodeo Arena Tower. Uh, the livestock barn, for some of you who might have been with us a while, we had to deconstruct that building uh, due to structural deficiencies uh, three years ago, and we've been operating with a temporary uh, temp facility that we set up during fair and event center time we're gonna to need to look at a long-term replacement, permanent capital replacement on that. And then that leads us right into analyzing the various fair structure models. So Board of County Commissioners working with the fair board are currently looking now at kind of governance and management arrangements so that we can align the capital asset management with the ongoing operations of the fair. Today, we don't generate enough revenue from the facility to set aside a reserve for capital repair and replacement. So that's the biggest long-term strategy that we uh, need to deal with. It's certainly on top of mind of uh, Ms. Bothwell and her board uh, working with our Board of County Commissioners. The event center that we sp uh, spoke of, these are the activities that are programmed the other uh, 359 days a year when the fair is not an event. Some actually have correlation to the fair. Others are completely independent. There's two categories. One is where we're providing access to this public facility at a revenue neutral that cost recovery process to provide broad community benefit and help uh, organizations fulfill their mission. The other is where we act can actually, uh, where the fair can actually produce revenue that can help support the uh, facility and also um, perhaps um, build up some reserves for at least some deferred maintenance. Um, I don't anticipate we'll be able to generate enough revenue off of the existing facilities to build new facilities. I think we're still gonna have to come up with a capital asset strategy that's outside of these operating funds, but that's just how, this is how we're measuring it today. How effective are we at covering our costs and generating revenue on non-fair days, and then how effective are we at putting on the fair and generating uh, revenue from that event. The County Event Center, again, no general fund support. That budget's about 714, and again, part of the transient room tax. So they get one distribution of transient room tax. It gets uh, distributed um, through the fair board and the fair management um, between the event center uh, activity and the actual fair itself. And we've just relisted the same issues there um, confronting the, the facility. Line of business for economic development, we actually have three um, categories of business development. We have a <clears throat> fully staffed uh, business and economic development 
department led by Catherine Grubowski Johnson. She's um, out ill today and not uh, available to be with us, but we have Tara Wilcoxon from her staff that's with us here today. That is uh, all of these three lines, all of these three programs in this line of business are funded from video poker proceeds from the state of Oregon. It's formulaic. All 36 counties get a formula distribution. This is the, one of our biggest risks in BCS is to this lottery proceeds. Two things, one is there's a concern that the video, this is video poker, there's concerns that video poker is kind of waning and there's limitations, constitutional limit, uh, limitations on gaming and the things that they can do to stimulate that. The second uh, risk to the, the budget is the new um, casino that opened up in Richfield that we um, believe, the state believes is gonna have a pretty significant impact on our video poker activities. And then the third is uh, every year, every legislative session, the, uh, this pot of money that's distributed to the counties is kind of uh, subject to uh, others' uh, funding sources. So the outdoor school that passed by initiative is looking for at this source of revenue to fund outdoor year-round outdoor school and uh, veterans, uh, some veterans programs are also looking at this source of revenue. There's two constitutionally defined uh, of the lottery proceeds that go to state parks and go to uh, school. The rest of it is somewhat discretionary uh, to the legislature and until we see how they work their way through the budget process, we're not going to know the impact. So we've been running, we got as low as a million two a few years ago during the recession. We're back up around a million seven of the annual distribution in this we take about two thirds of that um, to Catherine's department. She gets a little bit over a million dollars. Again, that's been flat. She gets the same amount every year. So as personnel costs increase, PERS increase, other impacts, the obvious uh, result is we can't raise revenue. Um, we're, you know, that revenue's fixed, so we just can't reprice it. So we have to be uh, more astute about um, how we provide our services um, to the public. Her department focuses primarily on the traded sector economy. These are the large uh, companies, larger companies that produce a product, either intellectual product, it could be a traded service, or it could be a traded good, durable. But that is about a third of the economy, but it supports the other two thirds of the economy that's non-traded sector. If you don't have a strong traded sector economy, you won't have a local economy. So we take these limited resources from the state, we focus almost 100% on traded sector businesses that export product out of this region and bring fresh dollars in. So her metrics, and again, this is just one of a number of services, but this particular one was Enterprise Zones. Enterprise Zones is a tax increment financing tool um, that was created by the legislature. Um, we've got a couple of Enterprise Zones uh, throughout the county that we administer. What that provides is a three-year or a five-year tax abatement for capital investments, and it must be tied to job creation and wage, certain wage levels. And that's audited by uh, Bob Verlman's assessor's department on an annual basis, and we have a clawback provision if, uh, if firms are not um, meeting those targeted um, goals of capital and jobs. So the recession hit this one a bit, um, a number of uh, Private sector companies have been sitting on their resources for quite some time and through the election. We think now activity is clearly picking up, unemployment rates getting to historical lows, per capita productivity is at historical highs, and we're finally starting to see the lagging average wage increase is now coming along with that product productivity. So we're starting to see for the first time in a, a couple of decades, wages starting to catch up with that productivity uh, number. Economic opportunity, this is the, the fund that, um, like we said, we take a, a, about two thirds of it to provide support to Catherine's department. That way, if we do have a drop in revenue, we're not faced with a, you know staff reductions and eliminations of our core programs. This is what we call a catalytic fund. So we accumulate reserves in here and we use this for one time projects that can catalyze economic development or can stimulate private sector investment and hopefully both. And a couple of key examples of what this project, uh, what this fund has funded is all of our contributions to the Willamette Falls Legacy Project in partnership with Metro, State of Oregon, and Oregon City on a very large uh, scale uh, public access river walk project. 
as well as working with the owner um, to uh, get some private development on there. Our primary goal is to is see that that Willamette Falls Legacy Project is an economic catalyst for the region, which is why Clackamas County is providing our lottery dollars to that one project. And it's not to benefit the property owner of uh, the Willamette Falls Legacy Project. It's really to try to stimulate the replacement of 175 traded sector jobs that were lost when Blue Heron Mill shut down, but also catalyze Main Street, the Cove project, the rivers, um, and a number of other uh, projects. We see this as a pebble in the pond uh, kind of development that will have regional and statewide significance for, for economic development. And we're working very closely with the City of Oregon City's economic development staff on uh, this project for that job creation. Also, we're fund, we came uh, from this fund, the North Milwaukee Industrial Area Redevelopment Project. We've also set aside for um, board consideration funding of additional activities along the McLaughlin Corridor as a priority of, uh, of the boards. And you heard earlier discussion of economic prosperity and targeted strategies towards um, depressed socioeconomic zones of the county, and this could be an opportunity fund uh, for those very targeted. Again, it's, it shouldn't uh, be used to fund programs per se because it's at risk, um, but it can be used to, for one-time catalytic um, investments and projects. And then agri and forest economic development. We break that out a little separate from Catherine's department. Catherine's department's focused predominantly on urban, uh, the urban footprint of the county, um, metro urban growth boundary, as well as the urban growth boundaries around our cities <clears throat> in the outlying areas. But 95% of Clackamas County is zoned for timber, forest, and ag. So F Catherine focused on the 5% that contains uh, the majority of our jobs and housing. Rick Gruen on our staff um, is managing the ag and forest economic development activities. And there's two key fundamental projects that we're working on here. Um, one is in uh, cross laminated timber. Um, we think this may be the product that will finally help us kind of reverse the trend of mill closures and job loss in our, our rural economy. If we weren't part of the Portland-Vancouver region with that 5% footprint that we have in, the, in, in Metro, we would be very much like the Southern Oregon uh, counties that are closing libraries and don't have the police services and those things. We heard mentioned before about the struggles of Malala and Estacada in terms of poverty and uh, houselessness and, and hunger. And you know that's a direct impact. We were a natural resource-based economy. Even our advanced metals manufacturers in the county, the blunts and the precision cast parts, all generated out of the old uh, tooling for sawmills and saw chains. Uh, so we were a natural resource-based economy. Thank goodness we're part of the larger Portland, Vancouver uh, regional economy, so we're getting some great growth in professional and business services, advanced metals manufacturing, and others, but we're still lagging woefully behind. Uh, we've lost more timber to disease and fire than we have harvested for productive use. So we're very, very hopeful that cross-laminated timber being a very green, sustainable project will um, help us work with the board on our federal and state policies on um, our publicly owned lands and get more. We know that we can generate uh, about a million dollars of gross revenue and uh, the board fee to produce you know, 17 to 20 jobs with a two week harvest that we can do on our one half of 1% of county forest land that we manage. We just can, we, we project what would the results be if we could manage the rest of the forest lands in Clackamas County like we manage our own and it would be significant. It would provide the county a significant amount of money to its general fund. And then on the, for, on the ag side, part of our ag investment strategy um, was the one-stop program, again, under Rick's leadership. That's a virtual clearinghouse of information for small producers to aggregate and produce product that will meet a larger market demand and have them um, be more successful. The board's direction to us was not to convert foundational farmland to commercial industrial, but rather how do we make our, our, our force, our legacy uh, uh, agricultural lands more productive. So that was the driving influence behind the ag investment strategy. Commissioner Savas, did you have a brief comment on that? Uh, no, I, or, I have some questions. I must make sure there's time for us for the questions. Yeah, okay. okay. 
uh, we'll speed definitely up. We'll come back to you, Eric. Then I know you have some. And again, this all these funds, no general fund support. We do get some uh, funding, uh, the urban forest program that we're piloting on behalf of the state through uh, uh, Representative Parrish's initiative is through this department as uh, as well as a U.S. Forest Service grant um, that we've applied for for uh, CLT. Library line of business, this is three areas. It's our library network broken into two programs, library systems and then shared services. Library systems is the network. We're basically the software provider for all of the libraries in Clackamas County. This is managed by Greg Williams in our department who's with us here today. Um, he's got some metrics here again, but this is really, um, this is a TS IT function. This is the back office backbone support. You want your um, support to be at 99% or better. Um, and Greg has done a fantastic job. Um, he has upgraded the system. He's got us on redundancies. He's got us on disaster recovery. We've been working with TS to modernize. We've got them located into much better uh, facility space. And so basically, all the materials come in, they get uh, integrated, they get cataloged um, within two business days before the materials are then put out into the system. Again, this is the one that does get general fund support. Um, this is a very large number because Greg's also, this library systems budget is also holding $3.1 million of special payments to city libraries. It, have not yet requested their $1 million capital fund. Um, we've got three remaining, I think, that uh, are going to be Wilsonville, Milwaukee, and... Milwaukee, Oak Lodge, and Malala. Milwaukee, Oak Lodge, and Malala um, that will be uh, requesting their final payments, and then this will um, flush out, finally, that, um, that reserve that's been set aside as that district formation. We do have some of our own reserves, including uh, capital asset repair and replace uh, hardware and software. The big issue or the big project Greg's been focused on is uh, RFID. That's putting little computer tags on every piece of material in the entire system. This will greatly expedite materials handling, um, speed up uh, checkout, check in, um, and result in great efficiencies to our entire system, which should allow us to provide more services <laughs> to our citizens. <laughs> so even though you'll see the benefits of this on the in the library uh, that you might attend, the backbone uh, behind a lot of this is uh, in the non-public face, which is Greg over here at uh, in the county facility. The shared library services are really the, the routing, the courier items that route materials around. And uh, it's, it goes without saying that we're able to have, uh, require a lot less collections at each individual library when we can consolidate and treat it as a single collection, if you will. So when libraries are ordering new materials, they're ordering new materials that benefit the system, in essence, um, as opposed to just that individual library because it's all part of this shared services. So they've got a very good, again, Greg has worked all the courier routes, made them much more efficiency with the routing. So he's kind of, he's a TS guy, he's a transportation logistics uh, manager. So he's done a number of different things and been and done a very, very good job and gets very, very high ratings from his customers, which are the libraries, including our own Oak Lodge Library. So Mitzi Olson, our manager of the Oak Lodge Library, is actually one of Greg's customers. So. Oak Lodge Library is outward facing. Mitzi is funded not from the general fund. So the first two line uh, programs you saw there were general fund support. This funding comes from the library district distribution. So this is formulaic. She gets a distribution based on the number of unincorporated populations served relative to the total unincorporated population in the county served by libraries. Um, she gets no city AV because her complete service area is unincorporated. So her uh, funding model's a bit different. And she's, uh, Mitzi's actually been building up a bit of a reserve because we're in a very substandard leased facility in Oak Grove, um, McLaughlin area. And she actually can't spend the amount of money that we distribute by formula to serve that population. It's not because she's not getting the right amount of funding, it's because she doesn't have the facility to provide the right level of services. So. Obviously, we're very, very keen on the, how the uh, Gladstone Library situ situation resolves itself 
um, because that will then be uh, predictive of the long-term solution for the Oak Lodge Library. So you see we had some tremendous results of programming upticks when Mitzi in 1516 just stepped up and started offering a lot more services in that cramped space by going outside and doing other things. Now that's leveled out because we basically hit capacity. So now we're kind of flatlined until we can resolve the long-term facility situation. Her budget's about a million three. Um, we distribute um, to the Oak Lodge Library, per the IGA, we distribute just what they can use um, in that space, in that programming, and then we hold the reserve for that in the library district budget. So Oak Grove's, Oak Lodge Library's reserve is in the library district budget. That'll be presented next Monday. So the significant issues, um, a construction of a new library to serve, whether it's in Gladstone or whether it's uh, two facilities, we're uh, to be determined. Uh, we have a lot of folks working uh, from the board very hard with their colleagues and the peers at City of, Col of Gladstone to resolve this situation. Our next line of business is parks, golf, and recreation. Stone Creek Golf Course is part of that. Um, this is uh, privately managed. We outsource to total golf management. Um, again, hit by seasonality. So the benefit here, though, is when tee times are canceled, rainouts occur, total golf management can actually um, not have staff come in that day. So they have a little bit better opportunity to manage their expenses. So we're still doing pretty good about hitting the margins. You know, so our revenue may be down, but our expenses will also be down. Not exactly. You know, so there will be some impact. But our arrangement with uh, Total Golf Management at Stone Creek is to be completely you know, self-funded uh, and taking care of all of its own capital needs and still distribute then excess revenue that then goes as part of our revenue stream into our county park system. And um, we monitor that very closely on a monthly basis. Laura meets with the Total Golf Management staff on a monthly basis and we do our forecasting and our Revenue, so we know exactly how that is tracking. And uh, we do everything we can to uh, maximize uh, but weather dependent, and this has been a really tough fall and winter. A um, uh, number of golf courses have struggled. One of the benefits of Stone Creek is one of the best, most playable courses in the region on wet weather days, but even it um, has its limits and capacity. So that budget um, includes then that interfund transfer. So this year we'll be transferring $300,000 over to the county park system. We target 400,000 of, of the transfer. That's what we'd like to have on a sustainable basis. And we are setting up a reserve. So the largest capital replacement item will be the entire irrigation system. It'll be approaching 15 years and it's going to need to be uh, updated and replaced. Um, that's a fairly large ticket item. we are already got 400,000 of the million set aside, and we hope to have that fully reserved for by the time that replacement uh, needs to take place. The county park system, again, no general fund support. Uh, the 200,000 um, that we have, that's been relatively flatlined for the last several years. Um, I do want to call out to uh, Department of Transportation Development, Barb Cartmill's department, the sustainability group um, provided funding for our dump stoppers program that's predominantly relied on federal funding, which is waning and probably likely to go away. Um, they have stepped up the last two years, last year and again this year, and provided funding to keep this uh, program, a uh, very successful program going. So. Greatly appreciate uh, TTD's interdepartmental assistance on this. Rate of occupancy in campsites. We had a number up there that was like 95% successful, but we were just measuring Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or holidays. And what we really wanted to measure is all days of the week and come up with a marketing strategy um, to target folks that could come use the campground during the week when they're not occupied. So people that might be retired, or have more discretionary time, or, have, or where they work weekends and off days. So we wanted, so while this rate of occupancy uh, looks low, it was, we did it on purpose. We did it to see what our total capacity is of our park system and then see if we can develop strategies to actually uh, fill it up more seven days a week rather than peak times of, of long weekends and holidays. 
Again, we're doing finally, um, this was this program struggled um, mightily um, during the recession and some other past things. We actually had to do some layoffs in this department. Um, over the years now, we've got on very good, solid financial footing. And for the first time in years, we're able to go in and start doing some capital improvements uh, to our systems. We've replaced all the playground equipment at all but one park. We've upgraded the restroom facilities, um, and we have a number of other projects uh, in the pipeline. This line of business we just call assets. So this is our 3,000 acres of forest and timber management. It used to be kind of consolidated in with the county park system because its predominant purpose is to generate revenue for county parks that don't get revenue from the general fund. But we wanted to carve it out and manage it separately as a portfolio. Um, once we could just get a true idea of the cost to manage this asset and the net revenue it can produce after funds are covered. And we also, um, this is also market dependent. You know, there's times when we're not going to harvest because the market prices just aren't very strong. Or in the most recent uh, example, we did an accelerated harvest. We did one accelerated harvest to pay off the Stone Creek golf course debt, which freed up more um, of Stone Creek revenue for county parks, more dependent revenue. And then we did another accelerated harvest because the stand we were in was a difficult one to harvest. So there was helicopter harvesting and other kinds of equipment set up. So once they were in, we felt just go ahead and take the full two, three year supply and we've parked it all in a reserve. So Laura's done a great job of setting aside. There's a very big reserve in this forest and timber management, but it may have to provide funding for several years of that dividend distribution to the county park system, if you will. The exciting project we're working on here is our relatively new forester. Andrew's been with us uh, some time now, but with Rick's leadership and Andrew and working through managing for results, we've got a brand new volume based uh, inventory. They've gone out and crew, they crewed the, uh, cruised the entire 3,000 acres. Uh, we've done aerials, we've done measurements, we've got it identified by the quality of the soil, the type of timber that's grown there, how fast it grows. So we're gonna have a much better volume forecasting and our long-term goal is to only harvest what grows so that we always have a sustained yield. And this tool now, it's just getting very close to completion, is going to help us uh, forecast that much better and identify what we can truly sustain on an annual basis of that dividend. Uh, this is totally dependent then on the, um, the sources of the, the, the timber. So we um, pay for this pays for itself um, through those timber proceeds. We have a land sale proceeds. We've been doing some swaps. We so sold some... Uh, sensitive lands that are zoned for harvesting, but politically, publicly, we're not sure we want to go through that harvest. We did a project with the BLM and Western Rivers Conservancy. We sold them property. We're taking the proceeds, and we're actually getting almost double the acreage sold closer to our wildcat harvest area around other commercial logging operations. So, and we filled in a gap in our in our vintage of our timber as well. So. We're going to see the long-term benefits of that land sale and swap um, over the years. Assets also in this area, we take in the tax foreclosed property that the assessor's office. So once the property hits tax foreclosure status and the county acquires title, it transfers into our department. This is kind of an arm's length. Our goal is very simple, is to get as many of these properties back on the tax rolls as possible. So we just measure that net change in inventory. How are we managing down that property? During the recession, it was really interesting. We used to get almost exclusively abandoned properties that had no value and little lot line adjustments and maybe really dirty sites. We had a couple hundred thousand dollar site we had to clean up out in Estacada one day. Um, but during the recession, we were actually getting duplexes, houses that were owned free and clear. There was no mortgage company behind them. Normally, if there's a, a loan on it, they'll come and get the taxes current. But these were homes that were owned, owned free and clear, or the lenders walked away, and we were taking in single-family residents and duplexes and things. So um, those actually have, so we've actually hired a realtor, and those are marketable properties. So we actually um, put those out and, and sell, and then the rest we also put out in uh, auction. And if it's no market to be sold and it doesn't get picked up at auction, then it remains held as tax foreclosed properties in inventory. And we still have, as you can see there, 135 uh, properties that are still held 
And some of those, like I said, are just lot line adjustments and things, unless we can work out arrangements with the neighboring property owner, you know, to take them over or something. So that'll be a long-term strategy that we'll work on. How do we dispose of these, um, these properties that have no, no real value? And this total budget is, again, no general fund support, totally self-supported. So the revenue that we do get in by disposition of these funds has to pay for the cost and set aside a reserve so that if we do take on a piece of property that requires mitigation or cleanup, we are dealing with one right now that has an IRS lien of a couple hundred thousand dollars that we have to satisfy. Um, that's the one organization you can't seem to that get resolved before we take, uh, take the property on. And um, so we, we need to set aside a reserve uh, for those unintended consequences. Um, so that is basically it. Um, I think the financial trends, re lottery revenues flat, expenditures are increasing at a faster rate than revenues. So again, managing for results, um, how we manage our personnel costs, outsourcing, all those things are on the table. Uh, we, we're spending a lot of time saying, what's, what services can we provide to provide the maximum benefit to our um, clients? And there's some services we may need to just stop providing um, due to the budgets and uh, the impacts. In our past PLP, we just had a very successful one. This was our, our river action plan. The board had the foresight to ban alcohol in the county park system, which helped eliminate alcohol on the river, and we're seeing fantastic success measures from that. So with that, thank you. Questions? All right, we thank you for your presentation, and uh, good work. So with that, we'll open up to questions, uh, Commissioner Sapp. I think someone was first. Was and Eric, was Eric first. Would, uh, we'll go ahead with Eric then, and then Commissioner Savas. Go ahead, Eric, thanks. OK, thank you. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things I was looking at in this particular area, because I, I look at the business and community services as being the, the uh, uh, point of the spear, if you will, for the economic goals that the, that the county has set and I'm looking at your KPMs, the key performance measures, mm -hmm. and I'm not seeing a relationship between the two. I mean, I see you, you're doing some activities, but you're asking me to infer that this is going to fund and, and future and provide for uh, the goals that the county has set. And that would be a, a, just a general comment that I have with regard to those. And Yeah, and, and those, as mentioned, uh it are contained in all those other services that we didn't pick up to highlight here. But yeah, we're very, very focused on high wage job creation, the performance Clackamas goals that were um, reiterated that the retreat um, just this past April. So that is clearly factoring into all of our activities. Because um, you're right, I, I do believe we're at the tip of the spear from an economic prosperity standpoint. That affordable housing question you brought up earlier today, the wage side is as critical as the cost of the housing. Yeah, and the other, other question I had with regard to affordable housing, is there some way that we could use those 135 houses that you're sitting on in inventory for homeless, the homeless? We've clearly looked at that. Again, those 135 properties, there are very few actual dwellings, habitable dwellings. A lot of them are just bare land. Um, a lot of our properties are just bare land and don't have uh, facilities on them. But we did have a duplex in Canby, and we did have a couple of single-family residences. But one of them was up in the Street of Dreams complex up in Beaver Creek, and it, it was uh, subject to a landslide. So we have all, all types, but we do look uh, for those opportunities with other agencies. And uh, one, of, one of them is economic development on page 16 and 17. And I think you, you mentioned that the uh, $1,090,000 for that is really not, is it grant funding or is it? Uh, it's an annual distribution we get from the state of Oregon. Um, all 36 counties get a formulaic distribution. So it's part of a million seven and a million nine of its million ninety is going to this department. Is, it, is that sufficient? Well, it's all we get uh, from the, from we're totally dependent on that video uh, poker economic development lottery money from the state of Oregon. We don't get general fund support for our economic development. Okay. Where is the video poker at? Which which department? Which area? Well, it's the million ninety plus the 600,000 in the opportunity budget plus 100,000. I believe it was around 100,000 in our ag and forest. So it totals about a million seven okay. total. Okay. 
All right. Well, in the interest of brevity, I will. Not that I would ever hesitate to ask for general fund money, but we try to be as self-sufficient as we can uh, in this budget. All right. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Savas. Yeah, I, I bring your attention to, well, for my question to page 19. Um, so, I mean, that's the, uh, just happens to be uh, the opportunity fund you're talking about. And, and I'm not looking for the answer today, but maybe something you can bring back as to what those monies can be freed up for or used for. And um, because there's a significant, you, know, you get a, a million dollar carry, over a million dollar carryover each time. Um, you have uh, basically, um, you look at 15, 16 actual as far as what, what was spent, um, 346 in, in 15, 16, um, but budgeted 2 million, 2.2. Um, actual in 16, 17 was 896 um, and, or projected, and you're proposing uh, 1.7. So my question is, um, you know, you've got a lot of cushion there. You really, you know, got about a 900, eight, a million dollars of, of room there. What, what was it in 16, 17 that you projected 2.2 that you didn't spend it on? Um, and what of the 1.746 uh, do you plan on actually budgeting? That's just one. So the same question applies on page 39. Page 39. Quite more a significant carryover, four point seven million dollars, uh, four to yeah four to three and a half to four point seven. Um, you budgeted or the amended budget was five point five million, but actual we're projected at two point two, so that's half. Um, whereas proposed, it's again up near that same amount of money. It's four point six. Like to know what your goals are because there's a lot of room there. Yeah, I can answer both of those questions. One is we've got I've got about 20 programs here that are listed. We can get a copy of this to the budget committee, but this details out that re, that fund in economic development of all the different projects. It includes Willamette Falls Legacy Project. It includes our contribution to Greater Portland Inc. that provides our board membership. No, I'm, so. I mean the the delta. I'm talking about the delta. Which just take just take the 16, 17. What did you you budgeted? Amended 5.5. What didn't you spend? It's what we do is we we budget Catherine's budget with the million ninety over there, and then we put the excess into this opportunity fund. So it's basically a reserve. It builds up. It's lumpy. It builds up, and then it gets expended down. There's been times some of that contribution went into building this building here several years ago. So it kind of builds up. It's like it's more like a capital account almost. It's for one-time expenditures. So we budget the whole amount in there. But if we don't spend it, it becomes carryover. And sometimes we're accumulating resources for a bigger project down what, the road. What, what bigger project? What well, it? again, it's a, it's a whole number of initiatives. It's uh, brownfield redevelopment. It's the North Milwaukee industrial area. It's our economic landscape. It's uh, county. I, I, I appreciate you responding here. I'm not asking you to respond right now. No, I that's fine. I just I have, some, know I I have, have more questions than there are time. So I just want to get the questions out there. Maybe you can just come back sure. at a more convenient time. Absolutely. I'm trying to find out what didn't happen with the Delta that was not spent. And should it, should it be it's that time? High? It's just timing. Commissioner. But on page 19, interestingly enough, on page 19 at the very bottom, in, in the language down there, it talks about um, the two-year heritage project and so forth and about the uh, effective stewardship of locally owned museum collections and archives. I know there's a big need for that. So those monies can be freed up for a purpose like that. That would be great news. But there is a far more need than there is then there is money out there. If this money can be applied to that, I think that'd be a great cause, for example. So, uh, ben, page 39 is on the I did want to respond to 39 also. So I just mentioned that's where we accelerated the timber harvest. We put many years of proceeds in. So we have built that reserve, and then we're going to be dividending it out over the next several years. To county parks. It's the county parks. That, that's all it can be spent on? Yes. By state law? Not by state law, by policy. Okay. So I'm just wondering if because county so, parks don't get any general funds, so the the agreement was that the forests would be provide that revenue search stream to county parks in lieu of general fund. So if the goal is a certain amount where we can keep county parks flush, and there's a there's a, a still a delta of remaining funds. There isn't. Um, unfortunately, we'll know more after we do our volume forecast. But we we need a, about five hundred thousand a year, I think, is the general number to fund into county parks. 
for their operations. We try to get our revenue stream over in that lumpy area. Think of it like a portfolio that produces dividends. We want to produce a consistent dividend of 500000 a year, even though we're going to go years where we're going to buy and sell by doing timber harvest. We're going to get lumpy gains on sale and lots of things, but we want a consistent dividend to come out of that. But yeah, that's I, why those I, two I have been. I, I get that, but the, it just seems really high. Four and it, half it's very four high, and half but million we've done. Four and a half million dollars on, on a very small expenditure by at least a short history. I'm well, showing. we may not be able to do a harvest for another three to four years. Okay. So that may have to fund county parks for the next four years. Yeah. And then on page 41, um, those assets, those property disposition assets, what can they be freed up for? And, you know, what's our policy? What's versus the state law? Maybe that's something we talk about in vision. And, and because the carryover there is over a million dollars, a carryover. Um, and again, um, you look at 15, 16, you only spent 232. Um, you're, you budgeted 1.7 million. Um, didn't use very much because projected was 304. So, I mean, you, you're actually projecting five times what you're actually spending, at least in that, in that one there. So We can't forecast that one, unfortunately. That's the one where tax foreclosed property hits. We don't know if it's going to be a $200,000 cleanup or a zero cleanup. So if the, we don't get any county general fund for those tax foreclosed properties. If the county general fund would contribute to cleanup and those other kinds of, when we get it, then we would turn this reserve back over to the county general fund. But today, we've been self-funded, and we've been completely independent. Yeah, and, if you, and of course, if you look at the totality of all your operations on page 45, that's, that's again reflected. Um, you've got 15, 16, um, where the actual was 17 million, but of all your operations, the amended budget was 35 million um, for the following year, and actual was, was 21 year-end projected. And yet, you're, we're now we're looking at 30 million, 30 and a half million dollars total of all these things put together. But our biggest actual um, was um, was last year at, at 10 million less than that, or 9 million less than that. Yeah, and again, 3.1 million of that is capital that's going to be distributed to library cities. Um, the big reserve we have in our county forest portfolio, uh, the yeah, money we have. I got that. So part. our contingency is, per Laura's direction, we've set aside 10 to 15 percent of our annual operating budget in contingency, but the other large dollar amounts have been accumulated, have been done for a very strategic purpose um, in each of those areas. They're certainly uh, subject to um, discussion from the budget committee and county administration, but again, we get no general fund support, so we tend to reserve in each of our lines of business um, to, for the anticipated, uh, whether it's a foreclosed property that may come with a big amount of cleanup to it, or whether it's four years of not being able to harvest any timber. What we're trying to do is make sure that we can sustain operations, but not have excess reserves sitting there providing no value. So I understand so, exactly where you're So what I'm going, to, I'm going to do later is I'm going to total up what you have on page 19, page 39, and page 41, and there's just millions of dollars that mm -hmm. are, they look good on the bank account, but if we can put those to good use, um, I'd like to know what we can do with those. Dollars. My one recommendation to the committee would be not total them up and look at them into to totality because each one of those reserves is very specific to that line of business. So I would, I would look at looking at the reserve for that line of business and seeing if it could be freed up, but not just in the totality. Um, well, Doug, go ahead. Uh, next yeah, question. Just a, a quick question. I'm kind of following up on that, and I know from the Joe Pinto, I have a response. The money that comes from the real estate lottery fund, mm -hmm. those only can be used on specific kinds of things, or once they come in, and I mean, there, are, there is legislative guidance. It was created through state legislation, so there's legislative guidance. And after a couple of years of it being in effect, the legislature passed a follow-up uh, requiring every county to submit an annual report showing how they are using those funds towards those uh, achieved. I will say that I will put our report up against the other 35 counties uh, any day of the week when it comes to how we're using it as intended, which is for job creation, economic prosperity, and, and economic development. I can't say that every county does that. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Yeah, one more? Okay, Eric, go ahead. 
one last question. If you go back to the county fair and rodeo on page 10 and 11, uh, you got a source of other revenue. Actually, it's on page 11 of uh, 476, 432, then uh, projected 419, and then increase to 510. Can you tell me why the significant increase over prior years? Can you answer that one, or do you need that before you come up? I think I can. I just second. I'm having Lori Bothwell come up. Okay, because I'm also looking at the attendance deficits in those years as well. It's your, con it's your concessions. It, the line item includes concessions and rodeo sponsorships. So mm -hmm. I, I don't, I'm not sure why there's an increase, but that's the main two revenues in that line item. Okay. If you're comparing it to 16, 17, that was three days of 100 degree weather. So I'm going back to the 510. And as um, sponsorships continue, the goal was to increase that with the rodeo committee and the association this year to get more revenue from sponsorships through 17, 18. Okay. Now, is that, I'm, I'm looking further on in here, and the, uh, the tower at the rodeo is in an unsafe condition, is what you're basically telling us. It's actually completely destroyed, and the new one is in process of being put up now. Okay. Um, the Rodeo Association is a separate 501c3 who's pledged 10000 towards that project, and Canby Builders and Canby is also donating a lot of the wood and stuff. So the final number will be out. I'm not sure yet at this time. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Anything further from the committee? Yeah. At this point, I think uh, we want to thank uh, thank you for your presentation uh, this day. I think we're uh, now ready to adjourn for some lunchtime. And yeah, and I'm going to uh, say I think problem. you need 45 minutes is what I heard, and so we would uh, convene. Um, about 10 minutes before the hour, and okay. we'll make uh, whatever schedule adjustments we need to make. All right. Does that work? We'll uh, adjourn for lunch. Thank you, everybody.